We're coming into Bulawayo now. Um, tough long day. I think it's gonna be like 106k in total. And it's just started raining. It's the first rain we've seen since northern Tanzania, months and months ago. It's just spitting for now. Um, <laughs> but let's see what it turns into. Welcome back to our cycle across Africa. In this episode, we see Bulawayo, Zimbabwe's second largest city, and follow the road west to leave the country towards Botswana. The history told of most African countries all too often begins with the advent of colonialism. Before the arrival of European colonialists, the land now known as Zimbabwe was home to a diverse range of communities, each with their own unique traditions and social structures, the largest of which being the Shona, the Ndebele, and the Tonga. They were skilled in farming, animal husbandry and trade, and developed complex systems of governance that enabled them to organise their societies and resolve conflicts. But with the arrival of European colonialists in the late 19th century, these communities were subjected to a new set of rules and values that undermined their way of life. The colonizers sought to impose their own systems of governance, religion and economy, resulting in a violent and often traumatic period of change. Cecil Rhodes was a British colonialist who played a significant role in the colonization and exploitation of Zimbabwe during the late 19th century. Rhodes implemented policies that were devastating to the indigenous people of Zimbabwe, including forced labour, forced relocation and a brutal age of violent repression. He believed that the indigenous people were inferior and that they had no claim to the land or its resources. Zimbabwe was under some form of colonial rule for around 90 years, and then along came Robert Mugabe. The revulsion, I think, started uh, through the stories that our parents used to narrate to us how the white man came to the country, how he grabbed the land, and in a society where you have a class whose main purpose and accepted privilege is to exploit others, you naturally get revulsed if the majority of people are being oppressed, being exploited, you can't avoid, if you have any moral principles at all, um, the call to do something about it. Zimbabwe gained independence in 1980 in a bloody campaign spearheaded by a young Robert Mugabe, who seized power and at first brought prosperity to an extremely divided country. <laughs> give people food, houses, farms, money and everything they want. Mugabe's government seized land from white farmers and redistributed it to landless black Zimbabweans, leading to a significant decline in agricultural production and economic instability, mostly due to the fact that the friends of Mugabe's party who received the land were not taught how to use the farm equipment left behind, meaning that much of the farmland dried and became useless. The rule of Robert Mugabe was one of terror and oppression, a time when ordinary Zimbabweans lived in fear of expressing dissent or criticism of the government. Those who dared to speak out against Mugabe's regime were met with violence and intimidation, often disappearing without a trace. Fast forward to more recent times and we see Zimbabwe struggling to recover from a period of economic instability and political unrest. The countries had to adapt and adopt foreign currencies to survive hyperinflation, causing widespread hardship for its people. Yet through all this, Zimbabwe's resilient spirit has never faltered. The country remains a land of promise, where human beings and wildlife alike strive to find their place in a fast-changing world. Although the country is still ruled by the remnants of Mugabe's political party, efforts to address issues of land reform, human rights and corruption are underway, and we can only hope that Zimbabwe's rich legacy of natural and cultural diversity can once again flourish for generations to come. Morning. Good morning. We've ended up in uh, Bulawayo at a campsite in the middle of a, a big colonial park. And as we were coming in last night, there was a big rainstorm, and it took me right back to what I'm used to at home. 
obviously feeling quite conflicted about liking all this colonial stuff because it's been, you know, pressed onto the country. Um, but it's really bizarre to see what feels like a park in London with the same atmosphere in the middle of, uh, you know, dusty Africa that we've been cycling through for the past few months. Although Zimbabwe isn't that dusty. It's a bit more green comparatively. A little bit more, yeah, yeah, it's getting greener as see. Yeah. We are gonna go and explore the city today. We're gonna get some breakfast, we'll draw some USD. And the experience of going to a supermarket during hyperinflation and you know the, the differing exchange rates day to day and, and how you have to kind of navigate that and we'll see what we can find in the city. Yes. Do you uh, change money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How much uh, for one US dollar? If you have what? One US dollar? You have bond? Yes. Uh, I think 600. Yeah? Okay. 600. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> huh? Yeah. So can can I get my <laughs> uh, give me your number. <laughs> Ah, nice. Where can I get my thing? Uh, let me give him my WhatsApp number. 779. Hyperinflation in Zimbabwe resulted from economic mismanagement, government policies and political instability. The government printed money to cover deficits, causing rapid price increases. Land reform and increased military spending worsened the crisis. Prices skyrocketed, the Zimbabwean dollar lost value and living standards plummeted. In 2008, inflation hit astronomical levels and the government's attempts to revalue the currency failed. In 2009, foreign currencies were adopted stabilizing prices, although the crisis had already led to economic collapse, unemployment and poverty. Oh, can I ask, what's the uh, exchange rate for dollar? Huh? What's the exchange rate for dollar? Uh, uh, 750. 750? Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you. Zimbabwe continues to recover from the devastating effects. A few years ago, the government again reintroduced a new Zimbabwean currency known colloquially as the bond note, forcing anyone with a cash paying job to be paid in this. But the same thing happened again as people scrambled en masse to change their earnings for the far more reliable dollar. As we crossed the country, supermarkets displayed exchange rate to dollar for that day, and in the weeks that we were there, we saw the counter increase in number daily versus the dollar.
good evening. So we're sitting next to a campfire at the moment. It's um, nightfall, we're making some dinner. And it's our last night in Zimbabwe. We had, we crossed through it very fast, which was the intention, yet slow enough to really experience the country and uh, everything that comes with it. And also met some lovely people, of course, as usual. Um, yeah, so our last, last night in Zimbabwe, uh, today we did a short day from Bulawayo. We only did 60K because here's a nice uh, wild camp spot. And tomorrow it's only about 40k until the border. And then we're in Botswana. And then from there on out, um, it's quite easy cycling, luckily, because it's one long, <laughs> long strip of road. But other than that, um, sorry. Other than that, um, yeah, we're just enjoying the evening right now and um, getting ready for tomorrow morning because we said we're gonna leave quite early we're gonna try because if everything works out we're gonna make it a big day um, approximately 130k maybe I don't know if everything works out fine <laughs> and the border crossing is easy then um, maybe we can make it to Francis Town. but we'll see until then we're gonna enjoy our little campfire have some food and um, see you tomorrow morning uh, a bit of a rough night last night uh, quite a lot of animal good morning a bit of a rough last night <laughs> good morning bit of a bumpy light blah 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 fucking hell <laughs> 